Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to talk to MAPS. And unfortunately, I've got to tell you, I've kind of got to cut this short because I have a hard stop uh, at uh, quarter till four. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is um, what else can you do with topo uh, bathymetric data? And you know, to be real honest, when uh, Maureen Iagandi asked me to talk, um, you know, I, at first I said, well, you know, I am not a, uh, a LIDAR expert uh, in, in this area. Uh, I haven't been doing research in this area, you know, all my life, uh, like many of you folks have. Uh, and for those of you who know me, you know that I came from the Southwest Florida Water Management District, which is a regulatory agency. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today with a uh, little help from Ray Miller is um, some projects that we've done uh, uh, cooperatively between the Water Management District uh, and Dewberry uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, that's me, I'm the dinosaur. These are our spirit animals. And uh, Ray Miller is one of our project managers uh, at Dewberry, uh, who's been mainly responsible for the large NOAA projects. So, uh, you know, what I had planned to talk about was just a kind of general introduction about topobathymetric data, not LIDAR in particular, a couple of platforms. And what I really want to talk about are, are some non-traditional applications for topobathymetric data. And then, um, you know, going last, it seems like everybody has already taken uh, a look into the future. Uh, my look into the future uh, isn't all that terribly different, but I thought I'd uh, just go through it real quickly with us. Well, uh, here in uh, the Tampa Bay area where I'm, I'm located, uh, we happen to have a topobathymetric data model uh, that was produced by the USGS uh, 2007. And uh, as things would have it, Amar Nyagandi is one of the authors on, on this particular model. Um, so when, when the regulatory agencies like mine look at things like this, you know, they, they ask us, well, you know, what's, what's the value of LIDAR, topobathymetric LIDAR, uh, as opposed to um, uh, sonar data? And, you know, just as a shout out to the 3D Nation program, um, the whole goal is to be able to integrate the topobathymetric data with uh, other types of uh, data, along with topographic data, to, com to construct that, that single seamless DEM from the tops of the mountains to the depths of the oceans. So, you know, we, we generally would go into a, a discussion of, you know, what is topobathymetric LIDAR? Because, uh, you know, many of the people at regulatory agencies really don't understand it. And um, I'm not going to show you any uh, equations or things like that. But, you know, you generally have to go through the, the discussion of, well, we're going to use green LIDAR, uh, green laser, and it's uh, the success of your mission depends a lot on your water clarity, the bottom reflectance, and the instrument that you're using. And that in general, we can see somewhere between one and three SECI disks. And, you know, most regulatory people understand that a SECI disk is uh, a, a 20 centimeter a disk that we lower into the water. And when it disappears, that's when the SECI disk is gone. So the, the sensors can see a little bit uh, beyond our visual acuities. Then the, the next question that they generally ask, you know, is um, uh, why LIDAR? And you know, the, the, the typical explanation is that the LIDAR are really good at nearshore areas uh, where light extinction isn't the issue. Uh, as opposed to sonar, which is really much better where, when we have a, a nice water column to look through uh, and when you can navigate a boat. So there, there are trade-offs. So it's not really an either or, it's how do we get them to work together? Um, the second thing that I'd like to do is just show people what some of the platforms are that we can use for uh, topobathymetric and uh, 
topographic data. Uh, we, of course, have the fixed wings, and we've all talked about these guys. Uh, we have some that are designed for rotary wings. And uh, to me, the most exciting ones are the uh, unmanned aerial systems that are coming on board now. And I, I, I love showing them these and, you know, telling them that, that these things, you know, th these are not the tiny little drones that we think of. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at lo lifting loads in the four to five kilogram area. And then, of course, my personal favorite is this, uh, the little orange one in the middle, the Helicio uh, uh, Super Bathy. And, and this thing is like designed to skim on top of the water. If you uh, go and see their videos, it's really kind of nifty. And then just to complete the, the, the circuit, if you will, uh, we do have a couple of space-based platforms. Uh, NASA launched the ISAT to, uh, in uh, 2018. And in 2020, this year, uh, uh, European Space Agency uh, launched the Cryosat tube. Now, ostensibly, these guys were designed to measure ice thickness. But as things turn out, they can measure bathymetric uh, ground uh, down to about 100 meters, which, again, is kind of neat. Well, with that, I want to show you some of my favorite uh, topobathymetric data projects that Dewberry did with us. Um, this one, like I said, this is my all-time favorite. And if I belabor this one a little bit too much, uh, that's probably why. Uh, it's removing noxious vegetation in Kings Bay, Florida. And being in Florida, I've got to talk about uh, Florida issues. Well, here's Kings Bay, and uh, they're, they're kind of oblique pictures. This is up in Citrus County, uh, Florida, and the, the, the story is really interesting. Um, Kings Bay is a, a, uh, the head of the Crystal River. It's the headwaters, and it's, it's made by about 21 first-order springs. So as the springs bubble up, in the karst, they fill up Kings Bay and the overflow goes out into the ocean uh, uh, through the Crystal River. The water temperature uh, in the bay fluctuates between about 70 and 75 degrees year round. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Florida, when the temperature, when the water temperatures out in the Gulf get below about 65 degrees, the West Indian manatees look for warm places. Well, it's not uncommon for the manatees, and, and I'm talking large herds of these animals, to come into Kings Bay, and they'll overwinter here. And we're talking two to 300 two-ton animals. And you got to remember, these guys are vegetarians. So they nibble on the, vegeta on the, vegeta on the um, vegetation, and two-ton animals, um, well, you can imagine what happens. Uh, so we end up with a, a, a rich nutrient bottom uh, in karst holes. In Lingbia, the algae that's here in the, the middle picture, is a blue-green algae that loves these conditions. Uh, it lives out in Kings Bay, and um, generally it grows on the bottom, and as it photosynthesizes, it makes these little nitrogen bubbles, uh, nitrogen and oxygen bubbles, uh, on its uh, filaments, uh, they accumulate and the algae uh, lifts in mats onto the surface. So basically every other week, the, in, the, the locals go out and they have a raking party to rake out the lingbia from the uh, canals uh, that, that, you know, it kind of accumulates in the canals uh, and it blocks them. Well, they do this and, you know, obviously it's a losing battle because the manatees keep eating. And as the manatees eat more, there's more nutrients. And as the nutrients accumulate, there's more link. So that it's kind of an ongoing cycle. And then the locals complain to the water management district. So um, the water management district uh, initially uh, tried to determine the volume of uh, both nutrient and lingbia that needed to be removed. Uh, the, our first attempt was with a single beam profilers, a sonar, and um, boy, that became expensive because we're only looking at about two to three meters of water, and in two to three meters of water, you've got a very, very narrow beam, and we've got several thousand acres, so it, it became cost prohibitive, uh, really, to, to survey the area 
with uh, Sonar. So uh, we partnered with, um, with Dewberry and Dewberry partnered with Jabaltex and we flew a seas mill mission uh, over the area. And what you can see here uh, in the bottom uh, picture, uh, the green points represent uh, what was uh, determined to be uh, bathymetric bottom uh, and the uh, purplish points are the top of what I'm going to call unconsolidated uh, material, which is uh, the nutrients and the, um, the lingbia. Uh, we call the area the Phoenix, and you can obviously see why. Uh, so what we did, or what Dewberry did for us, was construct two uh, surface models, one of the top of the material, one of the bottom, did a subtraction, and we calculated the volume of material to be removed. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of material uh, to be removed from, um, from, from King's Bay. It turned out it was cost prohibitive, but um, when we uh, compared the volume uh, in areas where we had single beam data to the areas where we had the um, uh, seas mill data, the volumes came within two to 3%. So we were really happy with the volume uh, that we were getting, and it helped us determine, uh, you know, that we could not possibly remove all of the lingbia, uh, but it did help us focus into areas that um, uh, we could remove the lingbia. So kind of a, a, an unusual uh, use for LIDAR data. Second example, uh, we have to move upstream just a little bit uh, into the Rainbow River. Uh, the Rainbow River uh, is about 15 miles north of the area that we were just in. And it's uh, uh, just like the um, um, Kings Bay. Uh, it's a first order uh, spring system that construct that makes a, uh, a short run, the Rainbow River. And um, here's a couple of pictures of it. You can see it, it's really pretty. And here we're looking at uh, three of the springs as they're uh, at, the, at the spring head. Well, <clears throat> the uh, uh, state of Florida, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Southwest Florida Water Management District uh, maintain and protect the spring heads uh, as Rainbow River State Park. The, um, the spring heads are uh, home to many, many diverse uh, species, as well as submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, several of which are protected in the state. So uh, believe it or not, and I know this is going to sound silly to most of you guys, uh, the way the district was um, uh, mapping the submerged aquatic vegetation was with a boat. Uh, a one meter quadrat, dropping the one meter quadrat into the uh, aquatic preserve and with a GPS uh, constructing a hand-drawn map. So we've been doing this for like years and years and years. In 2017, um, the district decided to try a new approach. And what we did is uh, we, we used an acoustic, an acoustic Doppler uh, column profiler to try to get you know as much data as we could, try to get the bathymetric bottom, the vegetation, the stream dynamics, and, and whatnot. Well, after a couple of canoe runs with several uh, ADCPs, we found that just plain wasn't working. Uh, so um, again, the district partnered with uh, Dewberry and NOAA in this case, and we flew a, a topobathymetric uh, mission over the uh, um, aquatic preserve. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here. And we accomplished uh, a density of somewhere around uh, eight points per meter. And just to show you the difference, uh, we're up near the spring head. And you can see where the ADCP, the, uh, the Doppler, uh, was able to gather data. And you can see that, you know, the cross section uh, in red on the top is the same cross section that we're seeing in the ADCP and the uh, uh, Regal uh, 880G. And you can see, obviously, that we got a lot more and a lot more complete uh, data. But that's not really the, the story. Uh, the story is this, is that the uh, preserve uh, 
is inhabited mainly by two species of, uh, of grass, of sub submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, strapleaf sagittaria and eelgrass, a protected species here in Florida. And they both grow to about three feet in elevation. Um, and in the lower uh, uh, image, you can clearly see the tops of the vegetation. Uh, the yellow square is one of our checkpoints. And yes, we went in the river with a GPS and stood there. And, you know, the, uh, the Rainbow River at this point was only about a meter and a half deep. So you, you can see that our uh, bottom is exactly on the bottom, which was kind of neat. Third project, we got to go now. Uh, the Rainbow River uh, comes into the Withlacoochee. It, it's a short run, and the Withlacoochee River uh, turns uh, westward into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, since 1930, and uh, just a little bit of history here, since 1930, there's been a dream to make a cross Florida barge canal. And this is a, a map uh, showing where the proposed route of this barge canal was to be. Uh, the, the project was actually initially funded in, um, as a work uh, project under the Roosevelt administration. Then Truman dropped the project, so it, it got like no funding in the 1950s, 1960s. In the early 1970s, uh, the project was taken up again, and this dam, uh, which is uh, it's called the Inglis Locken Dam, was constructed for hydroelectric power. The dam's now been uh, uh, decommissioned, but behind the dam uh, formed Lake Rousseau. Now, the Southwest Florida Water Management District, of course, is responsible for setting minimum flows and levels uh, on all of our uh, lakes and streams uh, within the district, and this is uh, no exception. So the impoundment over here uh, formed the Lake Rousseau, which if you can see my cursor, and then it, it just kind of squiggles out into the Withlacoochee River. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico is about a half a mile uh, to the west of this image. So um, in 2008, when the district uh, did its initial minimum flows and levels, we hired uh, um, a, a traditional uh, survey firm to come and do hydrographic survey. And they did single beam uh, profiles, single beam profiles uh, through the uh, flood, flooded area at about 500 meter intervals, which is quite typical. And we've heard this before from lots of other people today uh, that you would, you know, kind of tie them together. Uh, and then they made a, a couple of sweeps down the presumed channel of where the river uh, was before it was flooded. Well, since then, uh, the state of Florida has invested in high quality QL1 data uh, out here uh, uh, beyond the floodplain or in the floodplain rather of the river uh, beyond the flooded area. And we were left with this low quality stuff uh, in the river uh, and in the floodplain. So you can see the elevation model is really, really rough, uh, particularly in the areas that are of most concern, uh, the river channel and down near the dam. Now, as life would have it, we're looking at about seven miles uh, from east to west here, and we're looking about an elevation difference of about two feet. So the slope is very, very, very uh, low. The river is very, very slow moving. It's filled with debris. It's extremely mucky and the water is extremely turbid. All ideal conditions for topobathometric LIDAR, right? Well, when, uh, when I approached Dewberry about this, uh, they suggested, well, why don't we do single beam, um, I'm sorry, multi-beam LIDAR down the channel uh, do some multi-beam to pick up some, uh, some other detail and construct a hybrid DEM using topographic LIDAR, sonar, uh, and GPS locations. Well, that's exactly what we did. And to the, to the uh, benefit of everything, we now have a really high quality uh, hybrid digital elevation model constructed in this case from uh, two different types of 
uh, of sonar, uh, GPS loca localities, and high quality LIDAR. Just to show you uh, what it looks like, you can see the, the, uh, the nice smooth slope uh, along our, uh, when we cut a profile view through our dims. And of course we have uh, a nice high quality uh, data for the H and H modeling as we approach the dam. So I've got about two more minutes uh, that I have, and I wanna move further north uh, along uh, the coast up to the Appalachia, uh, Appalachicola Bay. Um, yeah, Appalachia Bay rather, not the Appalachicola Bay, but up to Appalachia Bay and um, show you a, uh, a, topogra um, a topobathymetric project uh, for archeological purposes. And this one is really wild because over the past 6,000 years, the Appalachia Bay has in fact invaded the land. So uh, paleo Indian sites are located uh, out underwater now. So we used a, a Regal 880G uh, on two, uh, two sites, uh, partnering with the Oscilla Research Institute. And here's a reconstruction of um, one of the paleo sites uh, on the Econfina channel from about 6,500 years before present. Uh, the picture on the upper left is the reconstruction and the uh, uh, topobathy image uh, of that very same site is there on the lower left. And you can see that our, our, our topobathymetric data, the little yellow dots uh, are places where the uh, LIDAR went extinct. But you can see that our, uh, our, our topobathy uh, dim uh, really shows us a lot of detail about what this paleo site looked like. When we cut profiles through it, we can, find, we can identify mounds. And um, one of the coolest things is we went and actually excavated the mound. And of course, it turns out to be an oyster shell pile. And of course, the um, Paleo Indians uh, up in the Big Bend area uh, were primarily oyster eaters. So here's a case of using topobathymetric uh, uh, LIDAR for historical reconstruction, and in this case, prehistorical reconstruction, which again, I think is just super neat. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this project just to get to one that's uh, very, very near and dear to my heart. And uh, this one involves sunny day flooding right here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, and it, it's care of a, a friend of mine, Steve Fernandez at the um, University of South Florida. This particular project, and, and this is very, very, very recent. If you look at the date, this is on, these are UAV pictures that were taken on the 18th of September of this year. Uh, this was a sunny day. Uh, a king tide flood, and you can see uh, the water in the roads uh, in this particular little uh, uh, subdivision. Well, it's the Shore Acre subdivision in uh, south of St. Pete, and it's within the area that was surveyed uh, by Dewberry last year. Well, what Steve did is he took uh, our data, combined it with the NOAA data, and used an ADSERC model to determine the inundation uh, um, uh, projected by the model, uh, given uh, intermediate uh, levels of flooding and predicted levels of flooding by 2040. So again, just kind of a, another type of uh, use for our LIDAR data. I'm gonna look into the future very quickly because uh, I'm basically out of time. Uh, but looking into the future, uh, I think we've all talked about some uh, topobathymetric LIDAR, but there are also applications for uh, using machine learning uh, AI on UAV derived imagery. And here's a, a, an example of um, using uh, UAV imagery for uh, bathymetric uh, um, measurements. Uh, we've all uh, discussed very, very briefly um, satellite-based bathymetry, which would be <laughs> taking that UAV to a very much higher level. 
And then we've all seen looking out on the horizon, the automated uh, mapping uh, through things like sail drone uh, and other uh, similar technologies. So uh, I, I think we have a really bright future to look at, uh, to look forward to. And I think there are all sorts of things uh, out there on the horizon and all sorts of things that we can do with um, topobathymetric LIDAR other than just simply measuring bathymetry. And I think that's all I have uh, for us today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email uh, either myself uh, or Ray and uh, there's our smiling faces. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And I know this is the end of the day and I hope everybody had a good one. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Al. Um, I know you have to go have a good class. Uh, yep. Al a, a class at U of Tampa. Yep. Uh, so he's gonna go do that. Um, wonderful day today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. We're always eager to hear from both federal agency partners um, along with MAPS members about the programs they're conducting. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us uh, for all of the dialogue events that we held over the past few months. In the near future, you'll receive an email indicating where you can view the recording um, of each individual event that you attended. The MAPS Board of Directors is currently reviewing future events, so if you have any suggestions or of topics, please reach out to a member of the MAPS Board. Similarly, if you have any questions about receiving professional development hours for the events that you attended, please reach out to Lisa Blair or myself. Once again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for the digital dialogue events. Without your time, effort, and financial support, we'd be unable to provide the informative topics we reviewed during our dialogues. Again, thank you for joining us. Be on the lookout for future MAPS events and have a happy GIS day.